Okie doke, about that time. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Hope everybody is well this afternoon, or as well as you can be under the circumstances. This is Psych 301, Research, Design, and Methodology. And so, uh, this is the last uh, lecture of new material prior to the final. Uh, so, Friday's lecture is going to be a review session for the final. And I sent you uh, an announcement on the uh, Canvas site. I want you to vote on what kind of final you want. So I had some people who didn't like the 30-minute time limit on the midterm, too. I don't know how widespread that feeling is, because people did really well on midterm, two. They did better than on midterm, one. And so I think maybe some people maybe like that format. But I did get a lot of complaints, and I don't know how well you liked it. And so the other option is for you to have the full two hours for the test. However, all the questions will be not the kind of memorization questions that you could look up in your notes. They're going to be questions that you have to think about. Uh, and so there'll be fewer quest of those questions, and each will be worth more points. So you get to decide. Uh, we'll have the class vote on this. You get to vote on which type of final we have. We can have a final that's very much like the midterm number two that we had with lots of the memorization questions, and it's time limited to 30 minutes. Or you can have a full two hours, but they're going to be a, a no memorization questions. They'll all be a bunch of questions that you have to think about, and each question will be worth more points. So uh, up to you which way uh, you want to go on that. Uh, fill out the survey, and then I'll announce on Friday during the lecture um, what the results were. We have a new skill that we didn't have previously for midterm two. That new skill is identifying survey sampling techniques, and I'll work on that during the review session on Friday. So you'll definitely want to tune in for that, but the rest of Friday will be reviewed. Okay, well, this is the last set of new material today. We've been talking about ethics, and we're going to continue with that. And under ethics, we're talking about ethical principles to consider when conducting psychological research. Ethical principles to consider when conducting psychological research. All right, let's put an underline under this and an underline under there. Awesome. Well, these are the principles of the APA code, and we talked about the first two last time. These are the principles that the department and the university apply to potential research studies to decide whether they are ethical or not. We talked about the first two last time. That is that subjects ideally should agree to participate and ideally, subjects should not be coerced into participation. And so now we're ready for number three. Three is uh, ideally the subject uh, should be fully informed about the nature of the experiment when deciding whether to participate. Ideally, the subject should be fully informed about the nature of the experiment when deciding to participate. So uh, the best situation would be if you tell the subject exactly what is going to occur during the course of the experiment, and then they can say, yeah, that sounds okay to me, or no, that it doesn't. But here's the problem. As you're well aware, psychology sometimes does not follow this, and that's because we want to avoid sensitization effects in many cases. I'd say there are kind of two possible levels of uh, not being clear to the subjects or not telling subjects about what's going on. Let's deal with both of them. Case one would be the subject's not deceived about what's going on, but they're not fully informed of everything that's going on in the experiment either. And you might do that just to avoid a sensitization effect. So you tell people, say, this is this task is a measure of clerical speed and accuracy. There's going to be a, <laughs> a series of symbols on a page, and what you're supposed to do is copy down those symbols uh, as quickly as you can. 
But what the real, uh, that's the dependent variable. What the real independent variable is, is the amount of light in the room. We want to see if that affects the person's speed at copying the figures. And we want to avoid sensitization effects. So we're not going to tell them that we're going to manipulate the light in the room. We just are going to manipulate it. And so gradually, let's say the light will get brighter for some people, and gradually it'll get dimmer for others during the course of the experiment. And we don't want to tell them that this is what we're studying to avoid sensitization effects. Well, that probably would not have any problem with the ethics committee with that. You haven't lied to the person, and the addition of the lighting really doesn't make the situation any more or less harmful or stressful or anything else. Uh, and so they would probably be okay with you not telling people that the lights are going to change while they're doing this task. So you haven't lied to them at all. You just didn't tell them one of the things that was... Uh, uh, one of the things you were manipulating in the situation. But, you know, a lot of things are going to be manipulated in that situation. The amount of noise is going to vary. So why couldn't the amount of light vary? Uh, that's usually not an ethical problem. The real problem comes when the subject is deliberately deceived. Now they're told something wrong. They're told the experiment's about one thing, and one thing is going to happen when, in fact, something totally different happens. Now, I bet you're familiar with some of these. The one that uh, is often brought up when discussing ethics is the experiments done by Stanley Milgram in the 1960s, where what he did was, I bet most of you are familiar with these experiments, he uh, brought two people into his lab. One was actually a confederate, but pretended to be an actual research subject. And then what was supposed to happen was it was presumably uh, an experiment on learning and how people learn, but really it wasn't. And so what they did is made one person the learner and one the teacher. The learner <coughs> went to a, another room and they hooked him up to this uh, machine that would shock them. And then the teacher was in a separate room and they were communicating over an intercom system. And so what the learner was supposed to do is learn these word pairs, and whenever they missed a word pair, they were to get electric shock that the teacher would give them. And every shock was higher in intensity. Well, eventually, the shocks get really intense, and the guy is, like, screaming in the other room, and um, uh, the, the, the subjects in general continued with the experiment and continued to shock people all the way to the highest shock. And so the real dependent variable there was at what point would the teacher be willing to say, I'm not willing to do this anymore. Um, there really wasn't any shocks going on. They were just faking it in the other room. The person was being deliberately deceived. And the, the shocking finding was almost everybody was willing to go all the way up to the top level uh, because the researcher kept telling them that they had to do it. Now, that's... Uh, uh, afterwards, of course, they were told everything that was going to go on in the experiment, uh, or everything that, that happened, right? They were told the truth about the experiment. But, of course, during the experiment, they're under a great deal of psychological strain. But I don't think that's the main ethical problem with this. I think the main ethical problem with deception experiments is that they may reveal something to you, uh, the bird to the subject in the experiment, that they didn't want to know about themselves. Like, uh, this person may not want to know that, yeah, I'm the kind of person, if some guy in a white lab coat tells me to shock this guy to death, I'm willing to do it. Uh, you may not want to know that about yourself, and it may lead to a loss of self-esteem when you, if you find that out about yourself. And so, I think that's the real danger of these experiments. Most people are fine with it after they've been explained that they were deceived in the experiment. Most people don't have a problem with that. But I think a lot of people maybe do have a problem if they find out something about themselves they don't like. Well, these are very common in social psych, and I'll tell a couple of stories now about uh, deception experiments that uh, I exp uh, have been, well, in contact with during my career. Uh, they do a lot of this at the University of Kansas, uh, and when I was there, one of my favorite experiments they did was they uh, did this experiment to try and see if a lie detector could be used to actually detect whether somebody was guilty of a crime. Now you're probably familiar with the lie detector, the polygraph machine. What it does is it measures signs of psychological stress. And so this would be like heart rate, your blood pressure, your galvanic skin response, which is how much you sweat, 
All of these things go up when you're under psychological stress. So the idea is if someone is lying, they'll be under psychological stress, and these physiological measures will show up that the person is lying. Okay, well, uh, the problem with that is even if you were totally innocent of a crime, let's say you've been accused of uh, robbing the Quickie Mart or something, even if you were totally innocent, of course, you're going to be nervous and under a lot of psychological stress just because you're being accused of this crime. So if you ask somebody, did you rob the Quickie Mart last night? Well, of course, they're going to show psychological stress even if they're completely innocent. So the question is, how can we get around the stress that's associated with uh, just being accused of something you didn't do to actually find out whether the person is telling a lie? And the answer is, well, you can try to use what's called the guilty knowledge test. Where what you do is, when the crime's been committed, you hold a, a back certain details from the press so that only people who were present at the crime scene would know those details. And then if you have a particular suspect, you bring them in and hook them up to the polygraph machine. And now you ask them a series of multiple choice questions about that information that had been held back from the public. So, for example, you might ask the subject, uh, at what hour was the crime committed? Was it committed between 6 and 7? Was it committed between 7 and 8? Was it committed between 8 and 9? Was it committed between 9 and 10? And you see what the person's stress response is to each of those questions, and you note which question gave the biggest stress response. Then you ask them another question. What color was the car that the perpetrator was driving? Was it red? Was it blue? Was it green? Was it yellow? And you see again which response gets the highest stress response. Well, the idea is that if I ask five such questions and the person is always giving the best stress response to the correct answer, well, that's good evidence the person actually does know the answers to these questions so that they were present at the crime scene. So what they were doing at the University of Kansas was trying to test this method of lie detection uh, in the laboratory. So what they did is they got a big like classroom, kind of like our, our classroom uh, when we were back at school, and had like 60 people sign up at the same time. And then what they had was the people would sit in the classroom at the appointed time, and the researcher would be at the front of the room, and they'd say, okay, this is uh, an experiment. Uh, we're testing uh, this new general knowledge test to test how much you learned in college. And we hope that it's going to be like the GRE test, or like the MCAT. Uh, this is a test that uh, graduate schools or professional schools who want to see how much general knowledge you have can look at uh, and decide you know, whether to hire you or not. And so as a bonus to you, because you're helping us out with this, we're going to put your score within your, at your permanent file in the university so that graduate schools and employers can look at it uh, if they want to. Uh, okay, so what I'm going to do is hand out the tests and then when you're done, my office is down the hall. Here's the office address. I just want you to come down and see me after you're finished with the test. And so the researcher leaves the room. All right, so the, the subjects in the experiments start doing the test. And the test, they find out, is really, really hard. All the questions are extremely difficult. Like, for example, I know one of the questions they used is, what is the principal color uh, in the flag of Burundi? <coughs> All right, so people realize this is a really hard test, and now there's a confederate in the room with them. And about 10 minutes in, what the confederate does is say, my roommate did this uh, study last week, and at the end of the study, they give you a sheet with all of the answers on it. And anybody who wants to cheat off my sheet, I've got all the answers right here, and you can cheat off. Now, the nice thing is uh, that most people weren't willing to cheat off the sheet, but always a few were. And on their tests, on each page of the test, was the subject number for each subject. And so when the confederate would give them the answers, the confederate would also note the subject number of those students who chose to cheat. All right, so now the people, when they're done with the test, they go down to the professor's office to turn it in. When they get there, the professor says, okay, well, thanks for doing this for us. We've been having some problems on this test with cheating. And as you know, cheating is a very serious, serious offense. You can be thrown out of the university if you are caught cheating. 
And so what we've got is a we've got this lie detector machine in the next room, and we're going to see if you cheated on the test. So they bring him into this room with a lie detector machine. They hook him up. And then they ask them the questions on the test in the guilty knowledge fashion. So they would go, what is the principal color in the flag of Burundi? Is it yellow? Is it white? Is it blue? Is it green? Is it red? And they do this process for several of the questions on the test, noting to which answer the person gave the biggest stress response. And what they found was, yes, they were very, very good at determining which students had cheated on the test and which students had not using the guilty knowledge test. Now, of course, uh, it's going to be somewhat embarrassing for the students who cheated. Now everybody knows they're a, they're a cheat, so that's kind of bad. But you can see uh, how this was necessary to be a deception experiment. They told people what was uh, going on. People wouldn't feel any stress when they were lying because they'd know it was all a joke and there weren't any stakes uh, attached to their lies. And so you couldn't really test the guilty knowledge test unless you deceived people. My favorite deception experiment of all time they also did at the University of Kansas. What they had done for this one is they'd set up this like fake computer. It was something that would look like a computer to somebody who didn't know much about computers. Now this was in the late 1970s when they were fewer computers around uh, then than there are now, so people didn't know what they were like. So it looked like, if you've seen computers on old 1960s TV shows, it looked like one of those computers. So it had like a tape spool on the front, it had a bunch of blinking lights and a bunch of switches and things on the front of it. All right, now what would happen during this experiment is they would have spots on the sign-up sheet for two people to sign up for a particular time, but one of the people who signed up was always a confederate of the researcher. So two people came in, both pretending to be subjects, but one was a confederate and one was uh, the actual subject in the experiment. So when the subjects would come in, uh, there would be the researcher at the front of the room next to this fake computer and he'd say, wow, I'm so glad you guys are here. I am just finishing up my dissertation research and this is, you guys are the first subjects I'm going to run on this. I just built this fancy computer that I'm going to use in my research here. and It cost me a lot of money. I had to actually borrow from my wife's parents to build it. Now the nice thing is, I've got just enough time left in the semester if everybody shows up for the experiment to collect the data I need for my dissertation. And if I don't get the data collected, well, uh, I have a job uh, as an assistant professor I get to take in the fall, provided I complete my dissertation. But if I don't get the experiment done, I'm going to lose that job. So that's why I'm really, really glad you guys are here to do this experiment. Oh, wait a second. I forgot the answer sheets. Uh, let me go back to my office and get them. So the researcher leaves the room. Always be suspicious when the researcher leaves the room. All right, well, at this point, we've got the Confederate and the actual subject in the room together. At this point, the Confederate says, I'm a computer science major, and this computer looks really cool. I want to check it out. So he goes behind the computer and starts looking at it, and he starts, like, changing wires around in the back of the computer, pretending to. And after a little while doing this, he tells the actual subject, uh, could you turn the computer on for me? There's a big on-off switch. And as you can imagine, the subject's a little bit reluctant to do this, but with enough social pressure, you can get them to go up and actually press the on-off switch. Well, when they press the on switch, what happens is <laughs> they got a strip of magnesium in the back of this computer. Uh, and I don't know if you've been in chemistry and lit magnesium on fire before, but what happens when they switch, slip uh, swip, switch the switch, <laughs> flip the switch, what happens is electrical charge ignites the magnesium strip and so all these like sparks and flames come out of the top of it and then they got this thing and makes kind of a grinding sound in this computer and then this trap door <laughs> opens at the bottom and a bunch of old radio tubes <laughs> fall out of the floor. All right, so it's pretty ridiculous but Regardless, uh, both uh, the Confederate and the subject then run back to their seats. 
And now at this point, the uh, psychologist, the researcher, comes back into the room. And he goes, oh, oh, what happened to my computer? And this is the point in which the independent variable manipulation occurs. There are two conditions in this sub uh, experiment. And uh, the uh, subject is randomly assigned to one of the two before they arrive. So one of the conditions is the confession condition. So when the researcher asks what happened to the computer, in every case, the subject just <clears throat> sits there and doesn't say anything. But if they're in the confession condition, the confederate says, well, we were messing around with your computer and we broke it. So they can, he confesses that they broke the computer. In the other condition, which is the non-confession condition, the confederate says, I don't know, we were just sitting here and it blew up. Okay. Well, now at this point, the researcher says, well, I can't test you on this because my computer's broken, so uh, you can't get any credits from me. But, well, they're doing another experiment down the hall on electric shock, so you can go down and do that one instead. So, he takes them down to this experiment on electric shock and pain tolerance. And what they have is a machine that uh, will allow the subject to deliver themselves electric shocks. They put electrodes on their skin, and then they have a voltage meter, and they can set the voltage to whatever they want, and then shock themselves. And they're told it's a measure of pain tolerance. So, the question is, how much of a shock are they willing to give themselves? The idea is, if they feel guilty... Uh, because of what happened to the computer, they will give themselves a higher shock than if they did not feel guilty. And the whole purpose of the experiment was to see if confessing to a crime made people uh, feel less guilty. So the prediction was that people in the confession condition would give themselves lower levels of shock than the people in the non-confession condition. And in fact, that's how the research came out. People who didn't confess gave higher shocks to themselves than people who didn't. Now again, of course, they told people what the experiment was about when it was all done. Uh, but you can imagine it's, it's going to be psychologically uncomfortable to think that you wrecked this guy's computer for a few minutes. And also maybe psychologically comfortable that you didn't have the courage to admit that to him if you were in the non-confession condition. Uh, but necessary in order to actually find out the results, of course. So you had to use deception or we couldn't actually research this. Well, I don't know how you feel about these deception experiments. I don't like being deceived. I think probably a lot of you don't either. And, and, and uh, I had this fantasy about maybe getting back at people who do deception experiments. I thought about signing up for uh, an experiment where I know there's deception, either because the professor who's conducting it has told me or one of the lab assistants has told me. And when I uh, go into the lab and I get the consent form, what I'm going to do is uh, look up at them and say, this isn't one of these deals where you deceive people, is it? Because let me tell you something, I will not put up with that for one sec. If you try and deceive me, if I even think you're trying to deceive me, I will personally beat thee living crap out of you. Now give me the damn experiment. <laughs> and then I see what they do. It's my own deception experiment. We could probably write that up when we were done if we wanted to. But perhaps that is best left in the realm of fantasy. All right, so that's number three. Ideally, the subject should be fully informed about the nature of the experiment when deciding whether to participate. Number four. Ah, number four. Ideally, in experiments involving deception, uh, subjects should be fully informed about the nature of the experiment at its conclusion. Ideally, in, in experiments involving deception, subjects should be fully informed about the nature of the experiment at its conclusion. So, of course, uh, you don't want people going away thinking in the Milgram experiment they've shocked somebody to death. You don't want people in the computer experiment thinking, going away thinking they actually broke this guy's computer and he's not going to get a job. 
So, yeah, you, of course, have to tell people afterwards about the deception. And typically, we're required to have somebody on call at the counseling center. And so if somebody wants counseling, there's somebody there who can give them counseling right away. I've never heard of anybody actually asking for counseling. Actually, most people are okay with the deception afterwards. But we are required to have that as a, an available option. Now, I want to tell you about an experiment. I'm interested in what you think, where the argument has been that maybe this is not a good idea. Maybe in this case, and there could be other experiments like this, it would actually be better not to tell the subject what the experiment was actually about than to tell them. And so let me describe this experiment. It's a famous one that was done uh, at Princeton University. It was on altruism or helping behavior. The subjects in this experiment were people who were studying to be clergymen, studying to be, I think, uh, Baptist clergymen. And what they did is they brought each subject in one at a time to do the experiment, and uh, they would meet in the professor's office to begin with, and the professor would tell them, we're glad you're here. We're doing a research study on sermon styles. We would like you to prepare a sermon, and then we are going to videotape it. Now, here is where one of the two uh, manipulations came in. Uh, it was the subject of the sermon. And so half the subjects were told, uh, we want you to give a sermon on career opportunities in the ministry. That was kind of the control condition. The other half were told, we want you to give a sermon on the Good Samaritan. Now, I, don't know if you, I don't know if you know the Good Samaritan story or not. It's a story that Jesus tells in Luke. And it's about uh, this, this guy who was beaten up by robbers, and he was robbed, and he's laying on the side of the road, and he's like, moaning on the side of the road, obviously in pain. And there are several people who pass by and don't help him, but the Samaritan, the good Samaritan, sees him laying by the road, and he picks him up, and he takes him to an inn, and he makes sure that he gets some food and a place to stay for the night. And Jesus says, you should be like the good Samaritan. You should be like the good Samaritan. Okay, so they tell them either to do the, like the sermon on career opportunities in the ministry or on the Good Samaritan store. Now, they say, we're not going to do the videotaping here. There's an AV room on the other side of campus where we will actually be taping your sermon. And here is a map that shows you how to get from here to the AV room. Now, here's where the second manipulation came in. The second manipulation was how much time they had to get to the AV room. So again, half the subjects were told, this is a second independent variable, so this was a factorial design. Half of the subjects were told, they are ready for you right now, and they're waiting there, so we need you to get over there as fast as you can, because we're behind schedule. So these people were under time pressure. They were told to get over there as fast as they could. Second group of people was told they aren't going to be ready for you for another 15 minutes or so. So you can take your time getting over there. There's no real rush to get over there. So those people were not under time pressure. They were told, I think they had 45 minutes to get over there. Okay, well now off goes our subjects. And here's where the manipulation occurs, the deception occurs. What the researchers have done is they've got this guy who's an actor and uh, they've dressed him up in sort of shabby looking dirty clothes and they've also put makeup on him to make it look like he's been beaten up. They got some uh, alcohol and, and poured, uh, I think, whiskey on him to make him ha sound uh, smell like he was drunk or had been drinking. And then what they do is they put him on the side of the sidewalk right by where the subjects are going to be walking to the 8V room. And he's laying by the side of the sidewalk moaning. In other words, it's the Good Samaritan story in real life right before your eyes. And uh, we're going to see whether the clergymen stop to help him uh, or whether the clergymen do not stop to help him. That's the entire dependent variable in the experiment. So the idea was that if they were thinking about the Good Samaritan story, that would make them more likely to help. And also if they weren't under time pressure, that would make them more likely to help. That's what they were testing in the experiment. All right, well, some of the clergymen did stop to help 
the guy that was moaning by the side of the road. But some of them did not. Some of them just passed him by and went directly to the AV room. So, when the subject shows up at the AV room, the question you have as a researcher ethically is, what do you tell the subject? One of the things you could tell the subject is you could tell them the truth about the experiment. What you could say is, well, gosh, you know, this experiment wasn't really about sermon styles. This experiment was about whether you would help that guy moaning on the side of the sidewalk, uh, like in the Good Samaritan story. And unlike what Jesus told you to do, you just left that guy there to rot. And everybody in the room knows you didn't help that guy. And what makes you think you ought to be a clergyman, you moral cretin? All right, you can tell them that. Or you could tell them, hey, we're glad you're here. Let's film your sermon. And never actually tell them what the experiment was about. And one could argue in this case, well, it's actually more detrimental to the subjects if you tell them the truth about the experiment. They're going to suffer a loss of self-esteem. And they're going to be embarrassed because everybody is going to know that they didn't stop and help this guy. Or you could just let it go, and the person won't suffer any loss of self-esteem as a result. Now, the university regulations required that in deception experiments you explain the deception, so they did have to do that. But some people have argued, well, in that case, it is more ethical not to reveal the deception than to reveal the deception. And so it's up to you. Uh, usually in class, I'll ask how many people think one way or the other. And I'll leave you to think about which way that one uh, should go. All right, so that's number four. Ideally, experiments involving deception, subjects should be fully informed about the nature of the experiment at its conclusion. Oh, and just to tell you how it, how it came out, whether they were thinking about the Good Samaritan story did not matter at all. And in fact, none of them realized it was the Good Samaritan story played out in front of them until they were, it was mentioned to them even though presumably that's what they were thinking about if they had to give a lecture on the Good Samaritan story. On the other hand, the time pressure did matter. People who were under time pressure were a lot less likely to stop and help than the ones that weren't. So that variable did have an effect on their behavior. All right, so that's number four. Number five, the gains to science should outweigh any harm done to the subjects. The gains to science should outweigh any harm done to the subjects. That is the justification for deception experiments. It's not nice to deceive people. They might learn something about themselves they didn't want to know. But the idea is the gains to science, the information that we can learn from these studies, um, uh, is more valuable to society than the cost uh, of the deception is to that individual. And so that's what justifies using deception in these cases. We can't make scientific progress without that. So unfortunately, we have to deceive people sometimes. Well, <coughs> this usually does not come up because all the researcher has to do is claim that the gains to science from this experiment outweigh the harm. But again, I knew of an instance at the University of Kansas when I was there when a study did get rejected on this basis. The researchers there had a particular prediction. They thought certain personality types would be more pain tolerant than other personality types. And so what they wanted to do was first subjects would come in and they give them a personality test. And then the dependent variable would be they'd measure their pain tolerance. What they had was for the pain tolerance portion they had this ice bath which is just a bowl with water and ice in it, so it's you know near freezing. And so it's very cold, and what you do with the ice bath is the subject puts their hand in the ice bath, and they just keep it there as long as they can. When it's too painful for them to keep it in the ice bath, they can pull it out, and there's a towel there, and they can, they can wipe it off. Now subjects knew this is what they were going to have to do when they signed up for the experiment, and of course they're also given the option of saying, no, I'm, I don't want to do this. Uh, so there was no deception involved. People knew exactly what was going to happen. And of course, they could take their hand out of the bowl any time and they, they would wipe it off. Well, this got rejected by the Ethics Committee. The Ethics Committee had found that there was another study that had been previously done on essentially the same research question 
they had not used an ice bath as their dependent variable. They'd used uh, electric shock tolerance where people give themselves shocks. That's how they'd done there. So it was just a different dependent variable, a different way of measuring pain. And what the committee said was the gains to science of doing it with the ice bath did not justify the pain that the subjects would undergo during the experiment. And so the gains to science did not outweigh the harm done to the subjects in that case. Now, that is a case in which I would disagree with the Ethics Committee. If you remember what I said yesterday, to me there are three criteria that have to be met for an experiment to be ethical. That is, you've accurately told the subject what's going to happen in the experiment, and they did that in this experiment. There's no harm that could come to the subjects that are not in any danger, and no, putting your hand in the ice bath does not put you in any danger. You can take it out any time. And then third, the subjects can stop the experiment any time that they don't like what's going on, and they did that as well. So to me, that is not an unethical experiment, and I would say, yes, there are gains to science from that. They didn't use the same dependent variable, so it sees, you can see if it replicates with a different dependent variable. Even if it had been exactly the same experiment, where they'd used the same dependent variable, I would say the gains to science were worth it, because replications are always of value. So... Uh, I would have disagreed with the Ethics Committee on that one. All right, so that's number five. The gains to science from an experiment should outweigh any harm done to the subjects. Number six. Ideally, uh, ideally, subjects should be warned of, uh, of any potential harmful effects of the research. Ideally, subjects should be warned of any potential harmful effects of the research. So if you uh, remember, I talked about the PET scanning study on Monday, and I talked about how we had to make the patient's blood radioactive. So of course, we had to tell the subjects, we're going to make your blood radioactive, and this rate level of radioactivity you're going to be exposed to is about the equivalent of two chest x-rays. Of course, we'd have to do that and let the subject decide what they want to do. Now, uh, that's definitely true. You should definitely tell subjects that, but the thing is, this can actually do more harm than good in some cases. So I had a friend, and he had this theory that certain classes of visual illusions would be affected by alcohol consumption. Alcohol would make them more intense and that other classes of visual illusions would not be affected by alcohol consumption. So what he wanted to do was have some people uh, get alcohol and other people not get alcohol, and then rate the intensity of various visual illusions. So he had to have peop some people at least drink alcohol. What he did was the control group would get a glass of orange juice. There were the people who didn't get the alcohol. And then the um, experimental group would get a glass of orange juice that had some vodka in it, a screwdriver, essentially. But in order to avoid uh, placebo effects, he had to tell both groups that they may or may not be drinking alcohol in their glass. And then he had to go through all the potential harmful health effects of drinking alcohol. So it'll lower your inhibitions, it'll uh, decrease your motor coordination, and it'll make you more impulsive, lead you to bad judgments. And of course, they had to have somebody there to drive them home to make sure they got home okay. Well, and then, um, and they, uh, I remember one of the things they told them was that it might even make you nauseous to take this alcohol. Well, as you can imagine, some of the people who took the alcohol reported some of those symptoms. However, because of the placebo effects, a lot of the people who didn't have the alcohol reported those symptoms as well. In fact, he said even one person even threw up who was t told they might have alcohol when they just had orange juice. Uh, and so this is a case where, uh, yeah, probably some of the symptoms that people got were just due to the placebo effect. They definitely were in the uh, case where they didn't get the alcohol. So one can say the people were worse off because we told them of all these harmful effects. But you got to do this. You can't certainly can't get out. Okay, number seven. Ideally, uh, subject data should be kept confidential. 
DLA subject data should be kept confidential. And there are a lot of questions on the forms you fill out when you're getting ethical approval, making sure you aren't attaching names to people's data at any time, that you're keeping uh, any identifier of the data separately from the data, and then also they often ask you when you're going to destroy the data so nobody can see it anymore. So, yeah, you should keep the data confidential for sure. But there are some instances where you pretty much have to reveal your subject. For example, I think I mentioned when we were doing the uh, stuff on single subject designs when we were talking about case studies. I've done some experiments that I published on Rajan, the memory guy, the guy who memorized pi out to 40,000 digits. And if you recall, he actually, I did a memory task on his visual memory, and he did worse than the control group on that task. Now, imagine if I tried to publish this result, but had to keep confidential that I'd tested Rajan the memory guy. Well, the paper would be, well, we tested this one guy, and he did worse than the control group. Well, that would not be an interesting paper. The paper is only interesting because it was, in fact, Rajan the memory guy that we tested, so pretty much we had to reveal his identity for it to be uh, a publishable paper. Now, of course, we got permission from him to publish the data. In fact, we'd asked him before the experiment even started, is it okay if we mention your name when we publish the data? And he gave us permission to do that, so uh, that was okay. Now, of course, HM, uh, he was a subject in many, many experiments. You remember him? He was the guy who can't transfer anything from short-term memory to long-term memory, so he can't learn anything new. And uh, I don't know if he'd be upset if he knew how many experiments he was in, but, of course, you just have to wait a few minutes and he'd forget all about it. All right, so let's go to number eight. Number eight, all reports of the data must be accurate. All reports of the data must be accurate. Now, in the other instances, I've often talked about maybe cases where you shouldn't do this, like keeping it confidential or uh, telling people about the deception beforehand, but or afterwards. But uh, for this one, all reports of the data must be accurate. There is no circumstance in which you should be reporting inaccurate data. The entire scientific process will fall down if people do not report their data accurately. And so I, like most scientists, would be willing to commit cannibalism before I'd, will, I'd be willing to put false data in an article. So this is a big deal for most scientists. And for years when I was teaching this class, I was so proud because I always said, you know, psychology does not have a problem with this. No one has ever been seriously accused of falsifying their data. The only case I could come up with was a very ambiguous case from the 1940s where somebody might have falsified their data, but in the end probably didn't. However, I can't say that anymore. The last few years there have been a big bunch of people accused of falsifying their data, and because I don't like these people, I want to give them a lot of publicity. And So we're going to talk about some of them. First one I wanted to talk about is Mark Hauser. Mark Hauser was a, a psychologist. He studied kind of a primatologist psychologist. He studied uh, monkeys uh, and particularly language uh, discrimination abilities in monkeys. Uh, and he studied animals generally. He wrote this book called Moral Minds. If in 2003 or so, if you'd gone into any trade bookstore like Barnes & Noble, or Borders Bookstore in America and gone to their general science section, you would have been able to buy a copy of his book, Moral Minds, about the morality among uh, animals, particularly among primates. Well, he was a primatologist, like I said, at Harvard, and he was doing some studies about whether a certain species of monkey could discriminate uh, speech sounds. Uh, and so some people said that they couldn't, but he thought that they could. And so what uh, this, how this experiment would work is they'll play like uh, a phoneme, like the, somebody saying the sound for the letter P, p and somebody saying the sound for the letter B, b uh, over the loudspeakers. And what the monkey is supposed to do is it's supposed to look to the left if it's the P sound and look to the right if it's the B sound. 
it gets a reward for looking in the correct direction. That's how it works. And so if the monkey can learn to turn the right way for the different sounds, well, then that's good evidence that the monkey is able to discriminate those sounds. Well, uh, Hauser published this article. He had collected the data on this. Uh, they videotaped the monkeys doing the experiment, and then he coded whether they were looking left or right on every trial, and he found that they could discriminate uh, the speech sounds in the experiment. Well, to their credit, a number of the undergraduates in his lab went to the administration. They had coded the videotapes the same way that Hauser was supposed to have coded them. They went through and looked on every trial whether the monkey looked left or whether they looked right. And when they did it, they did not find that the monkey could discriminate the speech sounds. They didn't find that the monkey uh, was turning the right way uh, on most of the trials. Uh, and then uh, the, there was a committee appointed to look into this. They reviewed the videotapes, and they all agreed he had simply lied about how the monkey was turning. Now, at that point, they put him on uh, administrative leave. They review, uh, uh, relieved him of his research duties. And my sub, uh, students, when I reported this, uh, right after it happened, I gave a lecture on this. Asked me why wasn't he fired, because of course I'd be fired in a second if I did that, and I didn't know. Well, about six months after this occurred, he announced he was leaving Harvard uh, in order to pursue opportunities in the private sector. So he was fired. They just gave him a year to find another job, so he got fired for that. And uh, I guess the good thing is that he had lots of federal grant money, I think in the millions, and he is required to pay all of that money back. So he's uh, essentially going to be working at minimum wage so he pays all of that back. So he definitely got punished. I don't know why he decided to do this. I can't imagine anybody's ego being that invested on, into the question of whether this species of monkey can discriminate speech sounds to be willing to fake their data. And there's every reason to suppose most of the data this guy collected in his life was fine, but uh, that was really bad and he's being punished. Next guy I want to talk about is Diedrich Stapel. Diedrich Stapel. He is uh, from the Netherlands. He's probably the most famous social psychologist in the Netherlands. So he had hundreds of publications at a very young age and had published articles in some of the most prestigious journals in science. Science Magazine is the most prestigious journal in the world and social psychologists rarely are able to publish there but he had published an article in Science, which was a huge deal. Well, uh, he uh, did these uh, studies on priming uh, and studies on uh, kids and kids and priming. Uh, and so what would happen when one of his students wanted to do a study, like uh, maybe for their dissertation and their master's thesis or just a regular old study to publish, uh, he, they would go and talk about the study, and he said, okay, I have some contacts at elementary schools, so uh, you just uh, prepare all the experimental uh, uh, files and everything, and then I'll go to the elementary schools and test the kids. And when people would ask him, you know, I want to meet this teacher and see these kids at this elementary school, he'd always say, well, no, if people, I'm worried people are going to start bothering them and want more data collection, and then they're going to tell me that they won't help me out anymore. So, no, I'm the only one who gets to have contact with these people. Well, then what he would do is, no, he didn't have any contacts in elementary schools. He would just go up into his office and make up the data. He would just make a spreadsheet and make data up to make it come out like uh, he wanted to for his theory. He'd done this a lot. He'd done a series of experiments on, he thought, um, he put out uh, this uh, cup full of M&Ms uh, and let people, uh, they were doing a task and they were allowed to eat the M&Ms while they were doing the task. One of the cups uh, said socialism on it and one of the cups said capitalism on it. And the idea was that seeing the capitalism thing would make you more greedy and so you would eat more M&Ms from the capitalism mug than the socialism mug. And that's exactly what he found. Well, it's exactly what he found because he made up the data. Uh, his study he published in Science, 
he claimed was done at a train station in Rotterdam. What he'd found was he'd made the, the area he made the area clean. He uh, and then he had uh, looked at how closely people were willing to sit with uh, next to one another, how closely they were willing to sit in these chairs at the Rotterdam uh, train station. And then he'd made it messy. He put a bunch of trash around. And what he'd found is that people would sit further from one another if it was a trashy area than if it was a clean area at this train station. Well, enough uh, weird anomalies came up with his research that uh, his uh, department chair called him in to talk about this one night. And he realized that he was being accused of this and he was going to have to provide evidence that he'd actually done these studies. So he actually went for the first time to this train station in Rotterdam. He'd never even visited it. He had just sat down in his office and wrote up this article, uh, totally making up everything, and published it in Science. And so what he was looking for at this train station in Rotterdam was a set of chairs that were arranged in the fashion that he described in the article so that he could point and say, yeah, see, here's where I did it. And he couldn't find anything like that. So he was just totally making everything up. I do not know if this guy ever uh, had a valid data point collected in his life. All of his students' master's theses and PhD dissertations were done with fake data. So he is definitely the worst in history, as far as I know. There may be others out there worse than him, but this guy is definitely the worst. So he lost his job, of course, immediately and hasn't been employed since. The university that gave him his Ph.D. has retracted his Ph.D., so he no longer even has a Ph.D. I don't know what he's doing now, but he did write a book about the whole uh, affair, and so he's actually selling this book and making money off of it. Uh, somebody decided to put the book online for free because they didn't like him making money off his deception. So if you want to read it, I guess it, it is available. And it, I don't know if there's an English translation or not. Of course, he wrote it in, in uh, Dutch. Okay, now what I, the question I often get is, what happened to his graduate students? Well, uh, they got to keep their degrees, even though it was fake data. There's really nothing the university could do if they'd rescinded the degrees because uh, he was um, committed fraud. Well, then, uh, of course, they would be able to sue the university, so he pretty much had to do that. All right, I'm a little bit over, but one last guy I wanted to talk about is Brad Bushman because he was on the psychology faculty here for many years. So he left about, I would say, about 2006. So we were on the faculty together for uh, 12 years. Uh, and then he got a job, uh, well, he's now at Ohio State University. Well, what happened was one of his students had done uh, her Ph.D. dissertation. She'd had people play a video game where you had like a gun and you were shooting at things. And um, what she did was she found that playing this video game made people more accurate at actually shooting a gun than people who hadn't played the video game. So the idea was that maybe playing this video game with guns would lead people to actually use guns. Well, some people were looking at this article that she published on her dissertation, and the data just looked too perfect. Like, uh, they couldn't be real data because they supported the hypothesis too perfectly. And so they wanted to actually take a look at the data. So they asked her for her data files, and she couldn't find them. Now, you're supposed to keep your data files for two years after your article's been published, uh, and supposed to have them available for examination. And so there was a huge investigation into what had gone on here and whether there, there was real data that had been collected. They all said they couldn't find it. And so what happened was this, his student had been given a job as an assistant professor at the University of Arizona. She immediately had her Ph.D. taken away for, from her because she couldn't come up with the data. And then uh, she had her job taken away. She was demoted to a lecturer for the semester. And then at the end of the semester, she was fired. So she is out of the field as far as I know. Now, another case came up where there was another article that uh, Brad Bushman was involved with 
where again the data just look too perfect I can't believe this is real data given how perfect they look can we look at the data files huh well when they asked Brad Bushman about this he said well one of our collaborators uh, who's in Europe he has the data and gosh we keep emailing him but he's not emailing back so I don't, I don't know what's going on uh, so we can't get the data files for you so it happened the same thing happens again the data look too perfect and when he's asked for the data files he can't come up with them well both of those articles have been retracted because you're supposed to have the data for two years after they're published and they couldn't come up with it they did a uh, internal investigation at Ohio State to see uh, if he was committing research fraud uh, they decided to blame his student for the research fraud, uh, and so he got off scot-free, but it just seems like too weird a coincidence that this is always happening to him. So we're just going to leave it at that. All right, I'm sorry. I went over with this lecture, so if you don't want to, uh, so I apologize for that. Okay, so on Friday, I'll announce the format of the final examination, and we'll have a full review session on Friday. So everybody... Uh, have a good week. I hope everybody's uh, all well. And I miss you. I miss you. I hope we were having class. Bye-bye.